Hello, hello everyone, Inquisitor Vaughn here, and in today's video, we are going to conclude with the Necron Deep Dive videos by going into the lore for the Ogdebek Dynasty. So, like, technically, I should have done the Thokt Dynasty last, being that they are the furthest dynasty to the west. However, I wanted to save the best for last, and this is why the Ogdebek Dynasty is the last video, but it's also the best dynasty, in my biased opinion. So, let's get into the lore. The Ogdebek dynasty has a dynastic territory in the Segmentum Pacificus to the west of Terra and the Sol system. By visual approximation, the Ogdebek dynasty has the closest Necron dynastic territory to the Sol system out of all the Necron dynasties. The heraldic colors of the Ogdebek dynasty are copper and emerald green. While people can paint their armies however they would like, and I am by no means an authority on paint schemes, there is this idea going around that the quote-unquote modern scheme for the Ogdebek has green shoulder armor and silver bones under a copper layer. This idea primarily came from Games Workshop's tutorial on how to paint the Necron dynasties in a battle-ready standard in which they painted the Ogdebek dynasty like this. However, if we look at the 8th edition codex in which they are featured in miniature form for the first time, we see that the Ogdebek warriors are fully copper colored except for their death mask which is silver. We are also shown a lich guard which is also fully copper but has more green in its scheme and hints of gold on the crest of its death mask. The dispersion shield is painted with rippling energy to likely show its efficiency. Like I said, I am not an authority in the paint scheme of the dynasty, but I encourage those who might be getting interested and started with the Ogdebek dynasty to reject modernity and embrace tradition in this matter. The difference between the warrior and the lich guard is the amount of green that is incorporated into it, emerald green being a heraldic color of the dynasty. I think it's safe to assume that the higher in rank an Ogdebek noble is, the more green they have in their scheme, which is why it doesn't make sense for warriors to have green in their scheme, especially with them being so low ranking in the hierarchy of things. But I digress. The dynastic Ankh is the following glyph, and it's said to represent the cryptex rod partially eclipsed by the dark sun of unknowable mysteries. Unlike almost every other dynasty that we have talked about so far, the Ogdebek dynasty has not one, but two heraldic colors, and their Ankh doesn't represent their dynastic territory or stars around their crown world, but instead it represents the cryptex tool of office, the Staff of Light. This is because the Ogdebek focus on and take pride in their technical mastery. In regards to the history of the Ogdebek dynasty, while we do not have any information in regards to their history before biotransference and during the War in Heaven, we do have some information concerning this dynasty after the War in Heaven. According to available lore, the Ogdebek came to an accord with the cryptex that advised the ruling court. When this deal was struck, the dynasty and the cryptex maintained a symbiotic relationship with one another, with the vast resources of the Ogdebek core worlds given over to the cryptex in return for the production of weaponry. Due to this alliance with the cryptex, the tomb world systems of the Ogdebek were reinforced with triple layer backup systems to protect its legions during the Great Sleep. The Ogdebek, according to the lore, were a small dynasty without much power before the Great Sleep. But due to their superior backup systems of their tomb worlds, the Ogdebek now have more power than they did previously because their legions have arisen from the Great Sleep in better condition than most other dynasties. Part of this bargain that the Ogdebek have made with the Cryptex is that no Cryptek in service to the Ogdebek dynasty may interact with the dynasty's canoptic constructs or the canoptic constructs of any other dynasty. The Cryptex are only there for the production of weapons. Only members of the Ogdebek dynasty's noble court have the privilege to interact with the constructs. 
See now, the wording of this is really interesting. Canoptic constructs are essentially the service and maintenance machines of the Necrons that serve both defensively and offensively. Things like the Canoptic Scarabs break things down into energy, which they use to reproduce themselves and can be efficient on the battlefield, as well as on a dormant tomb world. The Canoptic Wraiths are repair machines. Canoptic spiders watch over and maintain entire tomb worlds. Canoptic reanimators assist with the reanimation of Necron warriors on the battlefield. Larger constructs such as the heavy Seraptic construct still serve to protect the tomb worlds of the dynasties. They are all support machines in the shape of insect-like creatures. But because they play such an important role in maintaining the assets of the Necron dynasties, they are extremely valuable, even more valuable than the legion of soldiers in the dynasties. The cryptics who serve the Ogdebek are not allowed to interact with the canoptic constructs, which is normally something that the cryptics are allowed to do. So if they aren't allowed to do this, then who is? The answer to that question, like I said earlier, is the royal court of the Ogdebek, which implies that the Ogdebek nobles know how to repair their own constructs. But why is this an aspect of the deal that the dynasty struck with the Cryptex? It's because the pharaoh of the Ogdebek dynasty, Anathrosis, is particularly paranoid. The pharaoh of the Ogdebek dynasty is Anathrosis of the Black Star. Anathrosis is known for her paranoid streak because she is suspicious of the cryptex which advise her court. She is always accompanied by an army of canoptic constructs which she herself controls. Anathrosis is interesting because they are one of the few female necrons of the existing necron dynasty. There are others of course, some of whom we've talked about in previous videos such as Zun Bakir of the Maynarch dynasty and Arkasa of the Sautek dynasty. Technically, a female pharaoh is referred to as a pharaoh, but something that is also interesting about Anathrosis is that they actually prefer the title of pharaoh rather than pharaoh. So here's the thing. In editions previous to 9th edition, Anathrosis was referred to as he and as a pharaoh. In the new series Twice Dead King, in which the Ogdebek make an appearance, it was stated that Anathrosis is a matriarch, and misunderstandings about otherwise are dismissed as being false by the character addressing the subject, who happens to be the crowned prince of the Ogdebek itself. It is noted that they still use the title of Pharaoh, which is the masculine form of the word for the position. No one really knows why this is the case, and there are a few people in the community who interpret this to mean that Anathrosis is a trans character and has transitioned from identifying as a male to identifying as a female. I think that the 40k universe is big enough for a variety of interpretations of the lore, and viewing Anathrosis as a trans character has the potential to be harmless, however, at the same time, I personally do not interpret it that way. I don't think that gender norms in the 40k universe are the same as they are now, so I am unsure about how trans identity would translate into the setting. However, whatever it is, I'm sure it would be twice as different considering that we are talking about an alien species. So instead of viewing this aspect of lore from a gender identity perspective, I personally choose to view it from a historical perspective. Perhaps Anathrosis was always a matriarch, always a female, but had donned the masculine title of Pharaon and has kept it secret because Necrontier society appears to be male dominated, and the other Pharaons would have not taken her or her rule seriously if they had have known that she was a female. If we look at history, particularly Egyptian history, especially since Necrons and uh, the Necrontier are inspired by themes of ancient Egypt, we see examples of this, specifically with Hatshepsut, who was a woman but ruled as a man during her time as pharaoh of Egypt. Statues of her were made in male form, and she was known to wear a fake beard. If it is the case with Anathrosis that she was always a matriarch but has kept it hidden, why would she let it be known now? Well, 
As the lore says, before the Great Sleep, the dynasty was a small one, without the degree of power that they have now. After the Great Sleep, the Ogdebek arose in a significantly better condition than most other dynasties due to the levels of protection on their tomb worlds, which means that they are a far more powerful dynasty than what they were before. Perhaps Anathrosis feels that she no longer has to fear anything by letting it be known that she is a matriarch. However, she still chooses to be acknowledged as a pharaon instead of a pharaoh. But regardless of interpretation to the lore, Anathrosis is the pharaon matriarch of the Ogdebek dynasty. In regards to the crown world of the Ogdebek dynasty, it is currently unknown. There is an Ogdebek tomb world called Tamar, which is uh, in certain sources stated as the, the capital of the Ogdebek. However, unless GW changes the lore to that, that information is untrue, and Tamar is just a tomb world belonging to the dynasty. Considering the paranoia that Anathrosis is known for, perhaps the crown world is purposely hidden. But that's just like my theory on that, because you know, if I was Anathrosis or if I was a paranoid pharaoh and I was worried about protecting what is mine, I wouldn't let anyone know where the crown world is, you know? So I guess that kind of makes sense. But like I said, I'm just making up lore at that point. In regards to the enemies that the Ogdebek combat, their main enemy is humanity. That's right, Ogdebek Dynasty is on a constant war footing with the Imperium of Man because, as I said earlier, they are the closest dynasty to Terra and the Soul System. In regards to their tactics, the Ogdebek seem to have a focus on canoptic constructs, but they also field large numbers of obelisks and tesseract vaults in battle. And that has been my deep dive into the Ogdebek dynasty. Now, like in all of my videos except for the Thokt dynasty, they didn't even have enough information for me to do a key point summary. I'm still mad about that. But, like in almost all of my videos, I do a key point summary of the information that I go over in the video. So these are my key points on the Ogdebek dynasty. The Ogdebek dynasty is the closest dynasty to the soul system in the Segmentum Pacificus. The heraldic colors are copper and emerald green. They are led by a pharaoh, Anathrosis of the Black Star, who is a matriarch. The cryptics of her dynasty have assured her that the tomb worlds have triple layered backup systems and that their weapons are of high quality. This means that the Ogdebek are, are now a formidable dynasty whereas at one point in time they were not. Last but not least, the Ogdebek are on a constant war footing with humanity. So my thoughts on the Ogdebek dynasty. The Ogdebek dynasty are my favorite Necron dynasty. These are the dynasty, this is the dynasty that I play on the tabletop. This is a, uh, the army that I collect. Uh, I collect the Ogdebek dynasty. And I love their color scheme. There's something about the copper color scheme that's just so odd when you look at Necrons. And they have the fact that they have a silver death mask is like, it's very interesting to me to see. I love their color scheme. I think I have a thing for like dark metal color schemes because, you know, um, with my other armies, they're also dark metal. And I think I have a, a bias toward the dark metal schemes for the Necron. So like the Nexus and the the um, Zarekin and the Maynark. I, I like those dark metal color schemes. I don't know why. I think I just like dark metal. But um, I do play this army on the tabletop. I've been playing them since 8th edition. I've been collecting since 8th edition. And uh, they weren't my first Necron army. My first Necron army, I believe, were the uh, Novak dynasty. Um, but I soon switched over when I read the lore for the Ogdebek dynasty. And I've been playing them ever since. I like their focus on canoptic constructs, but I do admit that I misunderstood their lore for like half of 8th edition because I thought it was they had a bunch of cryptex who interacted with canoptic constructs and so in the beginning I bought a lot of um, technomancers and just cryptex in general and then a bunch of canoptic constructs when in reality the if I'm playing in a lore based sense uh, the cryptex can't interact with the canoptic constructs which means that the uh, the noble court controls their uh, canoptic constructs which is which this translates very interestingly on the tabletop because you either take a cryptic model and just say it's not a cryptic and just put another head on it um or 
you find a way to deal with the canoptic constructs with noble court uh members like overlords and lords and things of that nature so it's it's interesting to play so being that they are the closest necron dynasty to the soul system i am surprised that they are not talked about more it's actually mind-blowing because it's like the whole Macarius crusade it happened in the the segmentum pacificus which means it happened in that direction they should have encountered the necrons and it says in their lore that the Ogdebek are on a constant war footing with humanity um so it's like how is that possible that the lore that GW has looked over the fact that the Ogdebek have been fighting humanity to the West since forever. You know, we should have more artwork of the Ogdebek dynasty. We should have more stories about their battles. But for some reason, they are not, you know, emphasized enough. In 8th edition, at least, they had a profile of their information. But, um,. In uh, ninth edition, they were regulated to the Myriad Dynasties section, which is disrespectful. Like, if there's one thing I want to say about ninth edition, is that it's it's cutting down some of the importance of those uh, dynasties that are not as figurehead, you know, or not as uh, poster boy, right? Like in eighth edition, we had seven or eight dynasties that we could choose from. And we had images of them, we had lore on them, we had miniatures in their paint scheme. But in the in the ninth edition, it's just not the case. We have what four major dynasties, four or five major dynasties, and then the rest are regulated to a sentence or a paragraph in the myriad dynasty section. I don't know what's with that, but it's crazy. So like I said, the Ogdebek are my favorite dynasty. I am currently still growing my Ogdebek dynasty. I am working on personal narrative um, with the Ogdebek dynasty as the main dynasty. Uh, I am also working this year, I've made a goal to make a terrain project and the terrain project is going to be the Ogdebek dynasty. Um, I'm gonna create a Ogdebek tomb world. Uh, tabletop environment but it's not only going to be a tabletop environment it's going to be a entire system and it's it's going to be this huge project but basically the the system and the world the tomb world are going to be the dynastic territory of the Ogdebek dynasty uh my my personal and my custom overlord Zerifast the star hunter also known as a skittering lord is going to be the main uh antagonist slash protagonist depending on what side you're looking at um and yeah i uh i'm working on a project for the octobuck dynasty in fact here's a trailer that i made for uh this project i kind of like to hype myself up with projects you know so here's the trailer i made for it enjoy So the thing about using copyrighted music on YouTube is that you get a copyright claim. It's not a bad thing on your channel, I just don't want too many of them, but for that, I needed that specific song to capture the vibe of what I was trying to like do and what I want to do with this video and this, uh, this project of mine. So it's worth the claim, you know? But anyway, I'm glad that the Ogdebek dynasty is a little bit more popular than some of the other Necron dynasties that I've talked about in my Necron deep dive series. Uh, I, a quick Google search will show a bunch of people painting their Necrons in the scheme of the Ogdebek dynasty, which is cool. They might be painting them in the modern scheme, which is, it doesn't look bad at all. I'm just more of a traditionalist when it comes to the color scheme. I'm just overall glad to see that there are people playing the dynasty because they're the dynasty that I play and I'm biased, you know? um anything else i want to say about this oh also when it comes to the canoptic constructs i have a thing for canoptic constructs i like the idea of canoptic constructs because they're like the animals of the 
necrons like they're they're the servant species i know they're machines but the the how they're shaped they're shaped like giant insects i like that a lot you know and so that has a uh, an important part in shaping my army i plan on adding more canoptic constructs to my army to just make it like a horrifying machine bug army you know okay so i think i've talked enough in this video if you know someone who plays the Ogdebec Dynasty, please send this video to them. If you yourself play the Ogdebec Dynasty, please type in the comments for the glory of Anathrosis. Okay, cool. All right, Inquisitor Vaughn out. Remember, the Emperor protects and the future is successor.